Hi, my name is Ali Shinsava and welcome to this Breacher Digital SD step-by-step -step digital power supply design webinar using SCM32. Uh, over the next hour or so, uh, we're going to have a quick introduction to digital power. Then we're going to delve into a step-by-step -step design of digital power supplies, including control loop design and coefficient calculations. And after that, uh, we are going to introduce a software which does all the calculations for you and gives you all the coefficients and so on. This software is available freely from our link up here uh, and then we're going to have some really nice demonstrations based on what we talk about to show in real life what happens uh, when you design your power supply we're going to make some loop measurements also we're going to show you some step responses and uh, interrupt timings and things like that so first of all let's have a quick introduction to digital power we start with an analog power supply now in the analog power supply um, everything is designed in continuous time you get your power supply which is this power stage over here you get your output voltage and you usually divide that down with a potential divider and that goes into an op amp which is your compensator or your controller it is typically represented by a transfer function please don't worry about that uh, uh, in this uh, short webinar because the software that we use uh, will actually help you to design your password without needing to know the details of the transfer function. And uh, however, if you look at this uh, op amp, you will see that uh, you solder some capacitors and resistors. And of course, that, re that shapes the frequency response of the entire power supply in order to meet the stability criteria. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. The output of this goes to the PWM, which in an analog power supply is generated using a sawtooth uh, waveform, usually and a comparator. And that width will change depending on your error. Like we studied in control theory, it goes and drives the plant, it drives this FET, and therefore you've got a closed loop system. So in a digital power supply, things are extremely similar. Your plant is still exactly the same. However, the real difference is that instead of just having a potential divider and an op amp to create your compensator, we do this digitally. Now, this will give you some advantages. Uh, this has been very well documented, so we won't go through all the advantages and disadvantages of analog versus digital. Uh, the objective is to learn how to design a digital power supply. So you get your output voltage. This is in continuous time, and then it goes into an ADC. So you sample with the ADC, the output voltage, Inside of the microprocessor, you have got a demand or reference voltage. So you compare the ADC real measured voltage with what you want. So this number coming out of here is what you're getting. This number in your code is uh, what you want. The difference between these two is the error signal, just like the op amp. And then the main difference is that that goes into a digital controller. And you'll find that that is just one linear difference equation that uh, in most cases uh, which you calculate the good news is that first of all the library functions for these linear different equations are uh, already written for you and the software tools that we will provide for you uh, is going to calculate all the coefficients for this so effectively you get here a digital equivalent of the op amp compensator that you had just like analog the output goes into a pwm in the analog world that was a sawtooth and a comparator here it's the pwm uh, uh, part of the silicon of the microprocessor which will output a pwm signal that goes to the plant which again is your analog part it drives the mosfet and again you've got a closed loop system so the trick is how do we design this controller in digital domain and that is what we're going to talk about in this webinar uh, before we can do that we're going to have to talk about the power supply stability criteria now <laughs> Uh, in our workshops, we go through this in a, in a great detail. For this short webinar, it's, we're just going to have to concentrate on the main important points that you need to look at. When you consider the open loop frequency response of a power supply, I'm going to show you a few of these, and the software also shows you this open loop frequency response. At crossover frequency, you want your phase margin to be better than 45 degrees. I usually aim for 55 to 60 degrees. And uh, um, the... Uh, Crossover frequency is the frequency at which the gain plot crosses the zero dB axis. And the uh, phase margin is how much 
at crossover frequency, the phase plot is above the 180 degrees. Again, you don't have to worry about these too much because the software will calculate crossover frequency and phase margin and it will display it for you. So you don't even have to look at the body plot. Um, then at crossover frequency, which is again the frequency at which the gain plot crosses the zero dB axis, you want your gain uh, you want the slope to be around 20 dB per decade. And what I mean by that is that you want the slope to be shallow instead of sharp. That is, again, part of the stability criteria. You can see it on the body plot, but again, if you don't want to look at the body plot, the software will give you the slope. It de determines the slope and it prints it on the top corner, as you will see. So you will immediately see whether you get your 20 dBs or not. Now, 20 dB is theoretical. In practice, you rarely get 20 dBs. And anything around uh, 25 um, is usually safe. Now, finally, gain margin. Again, um, we discussed this in detail in various workshops and webinars. There's lots of information on the internet. Um, the gain margin should be at least 10 dB. And the gain margin is defined as when the phase hits minus 180 degrees, how much the gain is below 0 dB. You can see this on the body plot. And again, the software will just print it for you. So you can quickly look at crossover frequency, phase margin, slope and gain margin just as numbers. And, and, and we will know that uh, whether the power supply is going to be stable or not. There we go. This is the body plot here. Now, the uh, green trace is what uh, WDS uh, has calculated. This design absolutely everything. And the black trace is the real measurement, which I have measured with the Bode 100 um, network analyzer. Now, this software is full version of it. There is no, there's no hidden uh, locked features. Uh, is available for download from uh, this link here. And you can look at the body plot. You can work out your crossover frequency, phase margin, gain margin, and the slope. However, you can see right here that the software actually calculates it for you. So in my particular case, I have got a uh, crossover frequency of uh, um, 10 kilohertz. This is the um, green trace, which is the calculated one. As you can, it's because it's calculated, it's ideal. You can see that it's almost perfect. I designed for 10 kilohertz. I'm getting 10 kilohertz. I uh, uh, wanted a phase margin of 50. I've got a gain, good gain margin. I've got a nice uh, slope. Now, on my measured, uh, with real measurement, and again, we will do this later on in this webinar, I've got near perfect match. I have got uh, almost 10 kilohertz. I've got almost 50 degrees. And I, if you remember in the previous slide, I said that, that the minimum was 45 degrees. I usually aim for around 50, 60 degrees. But, but this is all good. A 9 dBs of gain margin and a slope of minus 24. Anything above 25, I would start to become a little bit uncomfortable. But this is a nice and stable power supply. Okay? So, here is the... Example of the analog power supply. Again, I, as I showed you, you have got your controller compensator. This is the op amp now. You see this potential divider right here. So output voltage gets through potential divider, goes through the op amp, PWM generator, and it drives the, um, the FET. This is a digital power supply. Uh, we've got our V out here, and then you can see that I've got uh, my ADC, and I've got a digital controller, which is inside of the microprocessor. So again, I start with a, um, a continuous time signal. Let's say that's my output voltage with ripple on it. Then I go to my ADC, and the ADC will go sample, 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 sample right? And that is this signal sampled through the ADC. You can, you can see just the contour of that signal over here. And then these are now in discrete time. So instead of the axis being time, it's an N. So that's your first sample or 0F sample, first sample, second sample, and so on. Then your demand value in analog world was a reference attached to one leg of the op amp. In uh, digital, it is a number inside of the microprocessor. Uh, so let's say you want 3.3 volts. And what you're doing then at every sampling interval, you compare this with that. Five microseconds later, let's say you're switching at 200 kilohertz. So your sampling interval is one over 200 kilohertz. That'll be five microseconds. So five microseconds later, you compare this with that through this block, five microseconds later, you compare this 
with that and so on, and you get a bunch of errors, which looks like this. So the green signal here you see is the difference between what you want here and what you're really getting here. Right? Then just like analog, it goes through a controller. Now in analog, it's an op-amp. In our case, it's a linear difference equation, which the software will calculate all the coefficients for. Now, for simplicity, let's say that the output of this controller is a number between 0 to 100. In reality, it's not. In reality, it's actually much bigger. And um, that number between 0 to 100 goes into the PWM block, which expects to get a number between 0 to 100, and that gives you duty between 0 to 100%, which will then drives the MOSFET, and you have closed the loop. Okay? So the digital equation here, that's the important part, is called a linear difference equation. And it can perform almost exactly the same mathematical operation as our op-amp. To give you an example, here I've got a simple integrator. So, so this, this uh, uh, you find this often as, uh, as just an integrator, uh, as, a, as a compensator. Um, you can see that the transfer function is minus 1 over SRC. Please don't worry about Laplace transforms and so on for this uh, uh, webinar. I'm just going to try to show you that I can create a mathematical equation that gives me the same gain plot as this particular op-amp. Um, the equivalent linear difference equation for this is for this circuit is this. Again, in our workshop, we go through how you derive these equations. Uh, we can, don't have time to do it in this uh, short webinar, but have a look. R and C, you know, if you know the analog circuit. And TS is the sampling interval, 5 microseconds for a 200 kilohertz uh, um, uh, power supply. Um, and everything else is in a library function. So all you need is to, to pass in these numbers right at the beginning, right? And these values come from either the ADC or previous inputs, and this is the output that the computer will calculate, the microprocessor will calculate, all within the uh, library functions that are available. And here are the results. This is the gain plot. The green trace is the one of the op-amp, and the blue trace is of the linear difference equation. And uh, um, you can see that um, it is almost an exact match. Now, what I have done on purpose, I have reduced the sampling frequency of the digital one so that you can see a difference. Otherwise, they are so perfect that the two would be completely superimposed on top of each other. It's just to show you that it's an approximation. And in order to design a good digital power supply, you must make sure that the sampling frequency or switching frequency is going to be much higher than the um, uh, crossover frequency. Okay? Now, how do we create uh, this uh, controller in digital domain? In analog, we have something like this, which is a... Uh, um, Type 3 compensator, in our case, it has got a transfer function like that. In digital, there's already a library function called 3pol30, which is the digital equivalent of the analog circuit. Okay? And here is the equation for it. All you have to do is pass in the coefficients and so on, and the software will calculate all of these values for you, and then it gives you the output. Okay. Now, here are the A1, A, A coefficients, coefficients there, there, and there. Um, and then here are your outputs, previous output, previous, previous output, previous, previous, previous output. And here are your inputs, uh, previous input, and so on. Again, please don't worry too much about this for this short webinar because the library function is written for you. And here are the B coefficients. You'll see that these are extremely cumbersome, but there is nothing here that the software cannot calculate. So they're big and cumbersome, and that's why we get the software to calculate these first. We paste this into our code, the library function is written, and your compensator, digital compensator design is complete. Uh, another thing that we have to consider is various scaling factors. Now, if you imagine, let us for simplicity say that um, you have got here a power supply with an output voltage of 3.3 volts. Okay? For simplicity, ignore these values. Let us, let us assume that the potential divider that goes to the ADC is just to divide by 2. Okay? So 1 kilo ohm, 1 kilo ohm, right? Just to divide by 2. That means that everything that we calculated that is being sampled by the ADC is off by a factor of two. 
because you have added an extra divide by two here, which you did not take into account in the linear difference equation. In order to fix that, you have got a scaling factor right on the output of your controller, which takes into account all the various scaling factors. You've got the scaling factor of the uh, of the pot, you've got the scaling factor of the ADC, you've got the scaling factor of the PWM block. Again, in the workshops, we calculate our workshop, we, we, we show how to work out various gains that you may encounter in uh, digital design. But uh, for the case of a voltage mode power supply, this is the equation that you need. But again, the software will calculate all of this for you and gives you the K. And that makes sure that your crossover frequency is where you expect it to be. And you can, again, download it free from here. Okay. So to give you a design example, let's say we've got a 3.30 design example for our lab. This is the one that we run in our workshop. These are the, uh, the uh, specifications um, and the coefficients that we get from WDS. I will demo that very quick, uh, very shortly. And of course, we will give you some real demos uh, in, in a moment. The coefficients will be these. K has been calculated to be to around 28. And the reference also has been calculated by the software. There we go. These are the results that I got. I got 10 kilohertz. Again, the green trace is what WDS calculated. The uh, black trace is what I measured uh, with my body 100. And we can see that we have got 10 kilohertz of crossover frequency, just like we designed. We have got uh, better than 10 dBs of gain margin, just like we wanted. And we have got around 46 degrees of, uh, um, of phase margin. Um, now, if you design this in analog, we would expect around 75 degrees. Now, there is a certain amount of phase deterioration um, in digital, which we're going to talk, we also need to take into account. The way we measured uh, the frequency response wise by using a uh, body 100, I get it, we put an injection uh, resistor there, and what happens is that the uh, body 100 will inject 10 hertz, 20 hertz, 30 hertz, 40 hertz into a power supply, and then you put two probes here and there, and it will compare automatically the height, i.e. the gain of the sine wave that goes in compared to the, to the uh, uh, height and, um, si um, and, and phase shift of the sine wave that comes out, basically across this um, uh, injection resistor. Um, and then it will plot the body plot for you, which was the one that you saw um, earlier on. And then you can compare the gain and the phase. This is the setup in the lab. Again, this is a type of setup we have in the workshop when, uh, uh, in order to measure. This is the board that we use in the workshop. It's a uh, buck converter that we design in the workshop. And then this is your STM 32 microprocessor card that plugs in, and um, you make all of your measurements with, uh, with uh, this instrument and, of course, with some uh, spec um, oscilloscopes. So you'll find that compared to analog, uh, there is a phase erosion uh, in digital world, and that is uh, because of two uh, processes. Uh, one of them is because of sampling and reconstruction, and the other one is because of the time delay from the time you sample your voltage to the time that you update the PWM. Both of these introduce a pure time delay into the transfer function, and a pure time delay translates into a phase loss. And of course, that means that we get more phase lag in a digital power supply compared to the analog power supply. In the demos that we do, we actually show that if you sample later in the cycle, i.e. this part of the phase lag, time delay, if you sample a little bit later, then because you've got shorter time delay, actually your phase margin improves. We will show that a little bit later. But the important thing to note is that there is this phase lag here. And again, you can calculate this by hand or you can use the software, which will take it into account automatically without actually you knowing. As long as you provide in the right information, uh, the, the software will calculate this and compensates for it. So if you need, if you want to have a 50 degree phase margin at the end, it will already work out that, oh, I'm gonna lose 20 degrees of phase margin because it's a digital power supply and designs it for 70 degrees in analog. So by the time that you've lost 20 degrees, you still get the correct phase margin that you expect. 
So we've talked about this software quite a bit. I'm going to demo it for you shortly. So quick introduction to it. It's uh, We've designed this uh, software uh, over the last 10 years now. It has become extremely sophisticated. Uh, it is uh, designed just to stabilize analog and digital power supplies. The free version that you have for SD is only for digital power supplies. Automatically calculates the poles and zeros as well as the controller coefficients. Uh, it uh, stabilizes the loop. It calculates all the gain and the phase lags that I uh, talk about. It even works out the component stresses for many of the components. Um, and uh, you can uh, download an unlimited version for SD microprocessors from this links, link over here. So uh, these are the specification of the power supply that I'm about to design. I'm going to design it using WDS, and then we're going to show you the real measurements and the real demonstration. Okay, so uh, here I am running uh, WDS. This is the software that uh, we talked about. You can actually download it uh, from uh, our website. Uh, if you go to uh, breach.com forward slash SD and then or SD-WDS, you can download it for free. Uh, um, First thing that you have to do is, is obviously provide the software with some data with regard to the specifications of your um, power supply. Here you've got the maximum, nominal, and minimum input voltages. Uh, you can type in maximum, nominal, and let's say minimum. And at that point, WDS not only calculates everything based on these worst case scenarios, it actually draws lines on the, on the body plot there, there, and there in order to show you what is the worst case scenarios with regard to your stability, crossover frequency, and so on. I'm going to return these back to 12 volts because this is just a demo. And now uh, I know that the, uh, three point, the output voltage is 3.3 volts and the uh, output current is um, 2 amps. Uh, this is the one of the many power supplies that we design in the workshops and actually we test it. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Michael Hallworth, is actually going to show you the real experimental results of this very, very shortly, as soon as this presentation is finished. Um, the ripple and overshoot uh, uh, requirement actually determines the size of the capacitor. Um, and um, let us leave this as they are, but if you change them, WDS will calculate everything. Then you have got your switching frequency and sampling frequency. Now, for the majority of the cases, the switching frequency and the sampling frequency is the same. But if, for example, you run out of bandwidth and you decide to sample every other uh, switching cycle, so you're sampling at 100 kilohertz. If you remember, I said this will introduce a big time delay, which will manifest itself as phase loss. You can immediately see that I lose my phase, and WDS gives you a warning saying that you have got a problem with your phase. Let's return that back to 200 kilohertz. Again, if you remember, I also said there was a second mechanism that caused phase lag, and that was the time delay from the time you sampled to the time that you updated the PWM. Now here, we are assuming that we are sampling the output voltage in the middle of the cycle. Now, if I change that to the beginning of the cycle, so if I were to sample right at the beginning, then I'd expect to have more phase loss. And you can see that the software again shows that you have got a problem because you've got too much phase loss. But that's okay, we're gonna leave it at that because that is where we are going to sample with this particular power supply. And actually Michael will demo for you live uh, on the oscilloscope and with the body measurement how by changing the sampling point of the of the ADC, you lose or gain phase. We're gonna do a real demo of this a little bit later on. So I'm gonna leave it at one. This, I will fix this warning a little bit later. Crossover frequency 10 kilohertz and 55, no, let's say 50 degrees of phase margin. Then the transformer tab is for all the transformer isolated topologies of WDS and of course, Buck, the buck converter is not um, uh, transformer isolated, so this is all grayed out. Then we go to the semiconductor. Now we use a very nice uh, uh, set of semiconductor switches, pair of semiconductor switches from ST, and here are the parameters from this device that is soldered on the workshop board. Uh, let's see, it was 240 picofarads and only a 0 0.1 volt drop. Okay, then we go to output filter. The output filter of the buck converter i.e. 
here. Now, the inductor is determined, the size of inductor is determined by the amount of ripple current. We're allowing 25% of ripple current, and that means that WDS has calculated the size of this inductor uh, as 24 microhenries, but I know that I sold it at 22 microhenry. Um, 22 microhenry um, inductor. You can see on the body plot that this is still not good. I'm still having a warning, but I also know that uh, my inductor has got 90 milliohms of um, um, DC resistance. Now, when I type that, WDS recalculates everything, the controller parameters, and now does manage to get it stable. You can see that I have now got a, a stable power supply, uh, but we can do much better. Again, based on the ripple, uh, uh, vo uh, voltage ripple requirements or the overshoot or undershoot requirements, WDS has calculated this output capacitor to be 230 microfarads. But I know that we have sold at 440 microfarads with uh, 55 milliohms of ESR. So again, you can see that it's, it's calculated. The gain has actually gone up. Uh, a little bit, uh, and uh, you have to uh, take into consideration that just as soon as I change these, WDS recalculates the controller parameter, so it's constantly adjusting in order to give you the best performance based on your specification. Then we go to the control uh, design, controller design. Here, WDS has uh, opted for a type 3 compensator, um, and it has placed the poles and zeros, taking into account all the time delays, uh, you can place the poles manually, but we don't recommend you do so unless you are very good at control theory and you know how to place these in order to get the requirements. But if you put automatic, it will give you these. Now, these will then get transformed using bilinear Z transform into the digital coefficients. At the moment, this is the digital coefficients that I have, but these are not correct. I've got a PWM clock master frequency, which in my case is um, um, 4096, uh, and uh, that gives me a total PWM count of 2480. That is a specification from the uh, SD part that we are using. I have got a 12 volt sorry, 12-bit, 3.3-volt um, uh, ADC, and the potential divider that is dividing down this 3.3 volts in order to uh, um, 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 get the right voltage to the ADC, the resistor values gives you a, a division factor or multiplication factor of 0.785. Now, that is now this scaling factor. Again, if you remember, I said that WDS will calculate all the scaling factors and gives you just the right value of K right here for the, um, for the compensator to, to, to actually make sure that your scaling is not off depending on whatever scaling factors you have got. So then, finally, I have got uh, um, the coefficients here. These are the coefficients that we have calculated. All I have to do is say copy to clipboard, and then you go to your code, and then you paste them in the appropriate place uh, within the code, and the design is actually complete. If I look at the frequency response, you will see here that at the moment, if this, is, this is absolutely ideal. Uh, I've got 10 kilohertz crossover frequency, 50 degrees of phase margin, 9 dBs of gain margin and 21, uh, a slow path crossover frequency of minus 21. And uh, if you remember from the stability criteria, this is actually a very nice and uh, stable power supply, uh, but this is all simulations. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass you to my colleague and friend, Dr. Michael Holworth, who is going to demonstrate for you uh, a real power supply. And we're gonna show you some real measurements and we're going to import the real measurement into this and superimpose the two on top of each other to show that it's actually working very well based on this STM32 device. This is my part of the uh, presentation. Thank you very much for thank you very much for listening, and I'll pass you over to Michael. Okay, thank you, Ali. So during this half of the webinar, we're going to look at how we set up the device using STM32 CubeMX, how we program, run, and debug using your IDE and then we're going to do some measurements on our closed-loop digital power supply. So, 
Uh, we're using STM32 CubeMX to set up our device, which is the STM32G474. CubeMX is very good because it allows us to configure the peripherals on board the device using a GUI rather than having to look at the H sheet and finding out which bit field does what to set up the required functionality. So for our digital power supply, we need several peripherals. We need the high-res timer to generate our PWM output, and we need the ADC to sample our output voltage so that that can be used by our controller. So let's set up some peripherals. You can see on our device that we've already configured the high-res timer outputs here. PA8 and PA9 by clicking on the pin and then selecting the high-res timer output. Again, click on the pin, high-res timer output. There are two outputs because we're using a synchronous buck converter today, so we need a high side and a low side PWM. We then configure the high-res timer itself by clicking on the timers tab, high-res timer 1. You can see we have TA1, TA2 outputs active for timer A. These are TA1 and TA2. We then click on the timer A tab here and there are several things to configure. We've set the clock to be the fastest possible clock speed, so 5.44 gigahertz for our high-res clock. This means to achieve our 200 kilohertz switch in frequency we need a period value of 27200. We then configure various things in our timing unit. We're not going to go through them all now, there isn't time but we will look at the dead time. So here you can see we've uh, added dead time between output one and output two. This ensures that output one and output two are never on at the same time, which is obviously you don't want them to be on at the same time uh, for synchronous buck or any half bridge type topology. So dead time is inserted. We then configure various compare units. So we have compare unit one here enabled with a compare value of 5000. This is just an initial value. It will be updated by our controller every switching cycle. So this is what is going to be used to uh, determine our effective duty cycle. We have another compare unit enabled with an initial value of 500 ticks. And this will be used to uh, trigger our ADC. We'll see the setup of that shortly. You can then configure external events if you wish, and these are often used for things like overcurrent events. So you could use the onboard comparator um, to uh, trip the high-res timer module and effectively uh, um, shut down the outputs in the case of an overcurrent uh, via the external event configuration here. We then have the dead time module. So the dead time has been con configured for 136 rising ticks and 136 falling ticks. We will see what that is in terms of nanoseconds on the scope shortly. And then finally, we configure the outputs. So TA1 is configured. That's our um, high side switch. The output is active high. We have one set source selection. So this is what the event that sets our output high. In this case, our timer period event forces the output to its active state. So if you imagine our timer is counting up from zero to the period value, when it reaches the period value, it will then set the output high. So that's effectively the beginning of our next switching period. Then we have one reset source selected. And the reset source is set to the timer compare one event. So that's the compare unit we just configured. So when the counter hits our compare unit value, initially 5,000, it will set the output low. So that gives us our PWM. We then can configure what happens to the output in the event of a fault or burst mode. And then there's the output two configuration. Um, so this will be our low side switch. Again, that's uh, active high. There's nothing else to configure here because this is handled by our dead time module. The dead time module will ensure that output 2 is always the complementary of output 1 with dead time inserted between the switching. So then we can look at our ADC triggers tab. We're going to use our high-res timer to trigger the ADC conversion. So enable ADC trigger 1, trigger source is timer A, and the trigger source has been selected as timer A compare 3. So that's our compare unit 3 configuration 
that we just saw on the timer A tab. That will start ADC conversion. So every switching cycle, every 200 kilohertz, ADC will be triggered by compare unit three. So let's take a look at the ADC. The ADC input pin is configured over here. You can see ADC one in one, PA zero. So we just click on that pin and we clicked ADC one in one. Then the ADC itself, if we uh, collapse this, expand analog, ADC one here, you can see in one is set to single ended conversion. And under the parameter settings, we've got a 12 bit ADC. Um, we are doing regular conversions and we have one conversion enabled. So rank one, so the first conversion and the only conversion is channel one. So ADC one in one is channel one. We sample it for 2.5 cycles um, and then we do the conversion. At the end of conversion, we have enabled interrupts. So there will be an interrupt triggered when the conversion is complete. And that is where we will um, run our 3 controller. The last thing to look at here is the GPIO, which is general purpose input output. So under system core here, we have GPIO and we've configured uh, a GPIO for, uh, for timing measurement. So PC2 here, we click on this, we click GPIO underscore output. So it's an output pin. We've given it a user label by right clicking, enter user label, so GPO1. And this is an output that we will use to measure the duration of our inter interrupt service routine. Okay, so then you would configure the project under project manager tab. In our case, we're using um, embedded workbench from IAR as our IDE. And then all we need to do is click generate code and that will generate the project files uh, and the source code and then copy everything and open the IDE. So let's do that now. Click generate code. And then there we go, successfully generated. Just click open project. It will open the IDE. So this is the, uh, the IDE uh, embedded workbench from IAR. There is also uh, an IDE available from ST called STM32 cube IDE, um, which is free of charge. This uh, IDE um, is what we use in, in our workshops at the moment. Um, and this, this project is in fact uh, an example from one of our workshops, um, example 3B. So if you came to the, the, the workshop, then we would run through this in, in great detail. So we've opened the main.c file and the first function we see in the main.c file is this main function. Uh, this is where the microcontroller jumps to when it starts and when it boots up effectively. Um, so this is where our execution will begin. You can see there are some green lines here. These are comments. So we have user code begin one, user code end one. You'll see this repeated throughout our code. For example, here, user code begin, user code end, and here. Any code that we write needs to be within these tags, within these comments. The reason being is that we're using STM32 CubeMX to generate our code and our, and our project files. So if we go back and change something, for example, set up a new GPIO or sample a new channel, then we press generate code. If any of our code is outside of these, then it will be deleted by CubeMX. Um, so we need to make sure that all our user code is in between these tags. So it persists uh, when, we, when we regenerate the project. So here we can see some functions that have been inserted by CubeMX. So HAL init sets up our hardware abstraction layer. Um, we have our system clock config, configuring our GPIO, configuring our ADC, and configuring our high res timer. So that's our chip set up by the uh, STM32 CubeMX and the HAL libraries as well. So now we have some user code. So here you see user code begin to. And this function here is our 3pole30 initialization function. So we're using a 3pole30 controller for our closed loop voltage mode uh, synchronous buck converter. 
So we have this function, which is part of our digital power library functions. We pass it a structure of type 3430 data float. This is a structure that holds all of the parameters required by our controller. So our controller coefficients, our previous outputs, our previous inputs, min max duty. And we initialize that structure with those uh, controller coefficients reference k scaling factor min max duty using this one line of code. Um, then we configure our uh, soft start. So we've got a soft start on this converter. So using control ramp float config, we pass that another structure, which is a structure for our holding all the, the information about our soft start. So that will be uh, our, our final uh, soft start value, the duration uh, and the update rate of our soft start. Then we perform an ADC self calibration and then we start our ADC. We start our high res timer outputs and our high res timer counter. And then all we do is sit inside our while loop. So while one here means we just go continue around this while loop. And inside the while loop, we have some code. We're delaying for one millisecond using the how delay function. And then we're updating our soft start duration, uh, direction, sorry. So we could do a soft start or a soft stop using this variable B power up. Then we update the value of our soft start. So that will be the reference value. And then we store the reference value into our controller structure. This code doesn't have to be here. It could be inside some slow, low priority timer function. Uh, it's not time critical. Uh, we just put it here for uh, ease of teaching. So there's no controller. Uh, there's no 3430 controller in here because that is within our ADC interrupt service routine. Remember, we configured the uh, ADC interrupts to occur when the ADC conversion is complete. So let's find our ADC interrupt service routine. Here it is, ADC1 IOQ handler. So this is the function that our microcontroller jumps to when an ADC conversion is complete. The first thing we do when we get into the ISR is set a pin high so that we can measure the duration of our ISR on, on the scope. Then we clear our ADC interrupt flag, and then we read the conversion value from our ADC and store it into our controller structure, so the M feedback element of our controller structure. Then using this one line of code, we execute our 3430 controller. So this 3430 controller is implements the equation that, that Ali just showed, um, so the seven multiplies and adds effectively. Um, using the B, A and B coefficients and our previous outputs, previous inputs, and our current um, uh, input subtracted from our reference, so our current error value. Then we update our uh, duty cycle, so set compare, so the compare unit timer A, compare unit 1 with the output of our controller. And then finally we set the pin low. So that allows us to measure the duration of this uh, bit of code here. OK, so the last thing to look at is our, our controller coefficients. Uh, Ali uh, showed you how to generate those using STWDS. Um, so effectively, you would paste them in the code here. So I have the, uh, the project open here um, that Ali configured. Press copy to clipboard and then just paste your controller coefficients here, like so. Um, I've already got k ref uh, in max duty defined down here, so I'll get rid of that. Uh, and these are our controller coefficients from STWDS. OK, so now we need to build our project, program the flash, run, uh, and run our code. To do that, we just press this button here, download and debug. If there are any changes, then it will rebuild the project that you can see it's doing now. Uh, and then once it's rebuilt the project, it will program the flash like so, and then get ready for debug. So now I'm ready for debug. The program is halted at the beginning of the main function. And when we press go here, it will begin execution. 
So before I do that, I'm going to bring the scope on the screen so we can watch the soft start. So I'm going to press go and bring back to this. You can see that the soft start ramps up to 3.3 volts. Nice slow ramp up there. Um, and then we can see on our scope various things. We have channel 1 is the high side um, PWM, high side switch PWM. Channel 2 is the low side switch PWM. Channel 3 is the ISR duration, so that output pin that we set high when we enter the ISR and low when we leave. And then channel 4 is our output voltage. So that is set to oh, that. We can measure that as about 3.3 volts, which is what we want. Let's take a look at our dead time. So you can see we have a dead time of about 100 nanoseconds, which is good. And the duration of our ISR is approximately, um, it should be about 650, 700 nanoseconds. So that blue trace there is the duration of our ISR. Okay, so that's pretty quick for a 3430 controller. Now let's take a look at what happens uh, when we change the load. So, so let's check if we have good load regulation. So channel four there is our output voltage. And you can see uh, the load switch is here. If I change the load, the output voltage should remain constant. Uh, yes, it does. The duty changes a little bit, but not too much. We have a synchronous buck converter here, so we don't go into DCM. We always need CCM. Uh, yeah, so the closed loop appears to be working. We have a regulated output voltage. That's good. Let's uh, look in a bit more detail now. Let's try and see our transient response. So to do that, I need to just turn off some channels. And let's change this channel to our output voltage to AC coupling. Not that one. Sorry. AC coupling. Uh, let's change our trigger to the output voltage. Let's try and catch the undershoot. Uh, this is all good. So if I look at, say, it's 50 millivolts per division. And we look at the time base as 50 microseconds per division, let's say. So we're on full load at the moment. Um, let's look, change this to normal and try and catch a, there we go, undershoot. So going from 50% to full load, you can see we have the undershoot there of the output voltage. So um, how long our output voltage takes to recover. Um, the recovery time is, we can see roughly about 50 microseconds, one division there, and the undershoot again is roughly about 50 millivolts. So uh, fast recovery, uh, small undershoot, but importantly, there's no ringing in the output voltage. We don't see any oscillations. So that is indicative of a good phase margin. There is sufficient phase in the system. So that's our undershoot. Looks pretty good. Um, now, if we uh, change this back to auto, uh, we can measure the loop and see what the loop looks like. So if I bring up uh, Bode Analyzer Suite here, so this is Bode Analyzer Suite, which we're going to use to uh, inject a sinusoid into our feedback path and measure the result as it passes through our system and see what happens uh, on the output voltage, measure the gain phase of this. So I've already connected the Bode 100 to our but converter, so I just need to press single here to do a single measurement. Uh, you can see on the scope the signal that's being injected. Uh, and this looks like a voltage mode buck converter. That's good. The crossover is 9.5 kilohertz with 44, 45 degrees of phase margin. Uh, not too bad. Um, now what we can do is save this to memory. So save this to memory like so. 
and import this into STWDS and see how well it compares to our um, theoretical result. So there's the um, uh, green trace is the simulated loop and the black trace is the measured loop that we just measured now. You can see we designed for 10 kilohertz, 50 degrees, and we're measuring 9.2 kilohertz, 46 degrees. So we're pretty close. Um, chain, the discrepancies are probably due to discrepancies in the plant, uh, using ideal values for our plant. As a reality, uh, things are a little bit different. Um, but the good news is with digital, it's very easy to retune your loop. Just change a few parameters here, get your new controller coefficients, copy and paste into your code. So we noted that the phase margin is a little bit low, we designed for 50, we've got 46. Uh, what can we do to improve this? Well, uh, as Ali mentioned, uh, that one of the main sources of the phase, uh, phase erosion in our digital system is, is due to the time delays. Now, when we set up our ADC, we configured it such that the ADC conversion starts when our uh, compare three value is uh, net by our high-res timer compare unit. So what we can do is change that. So we're, we're running now. Our program is running. Um, we can go view uh, live watch and enter high-res timer, oh, not capitals, high-res timer one. Uh, so this is a high-res timer structure. We are using timer A, so here is timer A, and bring this across, you can see compare three here. Remember compare three was set to 500 uh, in STM cube MX, and that gave us the sampling point for ADC. So if I turn the other channels back on on our scope, uh, bring this in, uh, change our trigger back to channel one. Uh, let's bring this back to DC. Okay. So on our scope here, we're triggering at towards the beginning of our cycle. 500 high-res timer ticks in. What we can do is delay that trigger. We don't need to trigger here because we're, we're triggering our ADC. Uh, we're jumping into our interrupt, we're reading our ADC value, we're executing our controller, we're updating our duty cycle, but because uh, we have effectively shadow registers enabled, the, the uh, shadow registers are copied to the active registers at the beginning of the next cycle, so our new duty cycle does not take effect until the following cycle. So we've introduced a whole uh, switching period or sampling period's worth of delay into our system, and therefore introduce some phase erosion. We don't need to take our measurement here. We could take it later. We have all this spare time in our period. So let's try doing that by shifting the point at which we take our cycle uh, sample. So instead of sampling at 500, let's try sampling at say 15,000 ticks. Our period is 27,200. So this is roughly halfway through our period. So you can see now that the um, blue trace here the ISR has been shifted towards the end of our cycle or later in our cycle. Um, so we're no longer taking our sample towards the beginning, we're taking it towards the middle. Let's see what effect that has on our Bode plot. So we go back to Bode Analyzer Suite. I've saved this existing trace to memory and you'll see that as a dashed trace when I take, take a new measurement. So let's take a new measurement now. So the solid traces are new measurement, the dash traces are old measurement, and you can see the difference in phase now. The phase does not roll off as, as quickly because we've reduced the delay in our digital system. And what's happened to our phase margin? Well, now we have nine kilohertz, not changed too much in terms of crossover, but we have 54 degrees of phase rather than 44. So we gained an extra 10 degrees of phase margin just by changing our sampling point. Um, so when you're designing a digital power supply, it's very important to consider all of the additional delays in the digital system and set your sampling points such that you minimize any delays and therefore minimize the phase erosion. 
Within STWDS, uh, that feature uh, is implemented here, so where we say pure time delay, what we mean here is the point at which you take your sample. If this is 1, that means we take our sample at the beginning of our period. If this is 0 0.5, it means we take our sample halfway through our period. And there we go. And that's how we configure uh, our uh, digital power supply using stm 32 cubemx using STWS to get our controller coefficients, um, and we measure the loop using our Bode 100 vector network analyzer, and we've seen, using our signal oscilloscope here, um, the transient response, uh, a nice stable uh, transient response with no ringing, um, and good load regulation, and that is a very nice digital power supply. That's all from us. Uh, thank you very much for watching. We, have, we hope you join us on our future ST webinars, and we hope to see you at one of our workshops very soon. Thank you very much. From me and Ali, goodbye.